So gender equality is a human right and not a female fight. And good morning and happy Women's Day to one and all who's present here. I am Dr. Diana Henry Selvaraj, clinical lead at Secura Health, and I will be your host for today. Secura Health is a cognitive AI platform which caters to the digital health of the public. So welcome to our webinar on innovation and technology for gender equality, which is the theme of this year's International Women's Day. We are happy to collaborate with Star Health Insurance in organizing this webinar in celebration of Women's Day and bringing together two distinguished experts as our panelists. This webinar also marks the beginning of an exciting new initiative brought to you by Star Health Insurance and Secura Health. We're excited to be launching a series of webinars which will be conducted frequently and cover a range of topics related to health and wellness. As you know, Star Health Insurance is one of the leading health insurance companies in the country with offerings that extend beyond insurance and include free medical and wellness services to all its clients. Through this new webinar series created in collaboration with Star Health, Star Health Insurance will be creating a platform for healthcare professionals and other experts to come together and share their knowledge and experiences for the benefit and well-being of the community. Secura Health will be helping Star Health in conducting these webinars. In the coming months, we will also be hosting webinars on a wide range of topics. These webinars will feature a range of expert speakers covering diverse topics such as lifestyle diseases, mental health, nutrition, women's health, and much more to help you stay healthy and informed. Now coming to today's webinar, we are thrilled to have Dr. Renita Rajan and Ms. Shilpa Kalkera with us today who will be sharing their insights and experiences on how technology and innovation can be leveraged to advance gender equality. As you all heard the icebreaker, Dr. Renita and uh, Ms. Shilpa are amazing panelists to discuss this topic. So I'm just going to share uh, the screen. The world has made significant progress in promoting gender equality in recent decades, but there is still a long way to go. Gender inequality remains pervasive in various aspects of our society, including education, employment, health, and political representation. In this age of technology, we have the potential to use innovation to overcome these challenges and create a more inclusive and equitable society. It can break down barriers and open new opportunities for women and girls, whether it's by providing access to education and health services, creating new job opportunities, or facilitating women's participation in political and economic decision-making. We hope that you will find this webinar informative and engaging, and that it will inspire you to act towards building a more inclusive and equitable society. So moving on to our first panelist, Dr. Renita Rajan. Of course, she needs very minimal introduction, as many of you would already know her and follow her on social media. However, her accomplishments and repertoire are worth mentioning. So Dr. Renita Rajan has 19 years of experience in dermatology, having graduated from the renowned Christian Medical College after finishing her MBBS from Kielpok Medical College. She's one of the few dermatologists in India to have an additional DNB, that is a diplomat in National Board. She also holds certifications in cosmetic formulation from Australia and in entrepreneurship from ISB Hyderabad. Her initial experience with hair removal laser led her to explore and eventually establish herself as a peer leader in energy-based devices. Her clinical experience with the picosecond laser helped her to provide key insights to the laser guidelines that are currently in use globally for skin of color. She specializes in the use of laser for conditions like lichen planus, pigment contact dermatitis, topical steroid damaged face, and pigmentary remarkation lines, some of which are unique conditions seen in the Indian skin types. 
Practicing in the south of India, her laser practice is an example of the fine balance between higher skin types in the higher ranges of UV index. She is also a renowned speaker and is invited at multiple conferences nationally and internationally. She is currently the chief consultant at Render Skin and Hair Cosmetics and Laser Dermatology Practice in Chennai. She is also the curator of Chosen by Dermatology and also the creative pa partner at the Lip Balm Company. So over to Dr. Renita to say a few words to outline your thoughts on this year's Women's Day thing. Happy Women's Day to everyone over there. I think um, while we take a minute or a day to actually celebrate the women, I also would talk about how it's becoming more and more equal to, uh, more and more important to recognize everybody, not just the women, but the people that empower the women, be they women or men, or uh, anybody that actually supports us in our um, journey to taking our rightful place as equals on the planet. Uh, looking forward to a very, very interactive and uh, enjoyable webinar coming up uh, with Ms. Shilpa. Back to you, Dr. Diana. Thank you, Dr. Renita. We're looking forward to the webinar as well. So moving on to our second panelist for the day, Ms. Shilpa Kajira. So Ms. Shilpa is well known in LinkedIn circles and is the founder and CEO of Myra Technologies headquartered in Singapore. Myra Technologies is an AI and blockchain solutions company which provides custom global industrial solutions excelling in research developments using artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things and mixed reality. Shilpa is the CTO and technology advisor to several new age companies committed to supporting the renal care foundation and breast cancer research and also provides blockchain based initiatives that enable information delivery and research data for focus communities. She is also a Neo4j's Graphy Awardee for Medical Breakthroughs. Additionally, she also mentors engineering students at Sahayadri College of Engineering and provides free advisory services to early stage startups. Ms. Shilpa is also uh, one and nominated as the Computer Society of India as the best CIO of digital transformation. She was also nominated as the Women Achiever by the Nabi Mumbai Cha Chamber of Business and Industries and is also part of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Program. Prior to Myra, she spearheaded data engineering at a Bay Area startup, was the lead technologist with a top corporate financial service firm and also had a stint as a principal architect at a Singapore B2C company. Over to Ms. Shilpa for articulating your thoughts on how innovation and technology can enable gender equality. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Dinah. And happy Women's Day, everyone. Um, I think this is a sign of evolving continuously and such initiatives to reinforce that what we can do to really become a gender balanced, evolved society together. So I'm excited for this talk because it, it actually covers how technology can also help that for each and every one here. And uh, I think as you know, wonderfully put by Dr. Renita, that it's, it's by all members of the society, men, women, and every human on the earth to make it equitable. So I think look forward to this talk and stay tuned to know different aspects of how technology can actually make that happen. So wish you all, all a very fulfilling day. Thank you, Shilpa. So moving on to a fun bit, we have a little quiz for all our attendees. So whoever knows the answer to these questions, please type out the answer in the chat box below. So the first question for today is who is the first woman chief minister of India? So we have a minute for everyone to answer this question. So I can see a couple of answers. Yeah, so I see two right answers. Uh, do we have a full name? It's nice to not just see one half of a woman's name, right? So it's always nice to see her full name in full glory. So two of you have answered as Kripalini. So moving on to the answer. Okay, we've got the right answer here. Suchita Kripalini. Great. So, 
Okay. So Suchita Kripalani was India's first female chief minister serving as the head of Uttar Pradesh government from 1963 to 1967. Moving on to our next question for the day. Who was the first woman Indian Air Force pilot to fly in a combat zone? Again, you can type in your answers in the chat box. You have a minute. So there's Nikin Hamilton in the audience who seems to know all answers. So it looks like you are a warrior for gender equality. Okay, we've got two right answers. Okay, so moving on to the answer, it is Gunjan Saxena, and Flight Lieutenant Gunjan Saxena is the first woman Indian Air Force officer to enter a war zone. She made history when she flew a Cheetah helicopter in the Kargil War and rescued several soldiers. And there is, of course, a very famous biopic in Bollywood. I'm sure many of you would have seen it. This is our last and final question for the day. Do you know why 8th of March is celebrated as Women's Day all over the world? Any answers? Okay. So, let's go to the answer. International Women's Day is celebrated on March 8th of every year to recognize the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women and to advocate for gender equality and women's rights. The 8th of March was chosen because it was on this day in 1908 that 15,000 women marched through New York City demanding better working conditions, voting rights and an end to discrimination. The idea of an annual Women's Day was proposed by Carla Zetkin, a German socialist, at the International Conference of Working Women in 1910. This date was also chosen to commemorate the day when women in Soviet Russia were granted the right to vote and participate in politics. And in 1975, the United Nations officially recognized March 8th as International Women's Day and encouraged member states to celebrate it annually. Since then, March 8th is celebrated around the world as a day to honor the accomplishments of women and advocate for women's rights and equality. So moving on, we now move on to the panel discussion. We will go on to questions to both Ms. Shilpa and Dr. Renita. So it's up to both of you to take these questions and give us really insightful answers. So let's go on to our first question. It's 2023. And why do you think we're still talking about gender equality? I think I can start with the number. Yes, Ms. Shilpa. 8.8% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Global population is roughly around, like should be like at the equal ratio, right? I mean, for a successful society. And 8.8 is extremely low on the top. So when on the top, if decisions of businesses, market dynamics, industrial decisions are actually biased by one gender, then imagine how, you know, the entire industry shapes the working habits, the day-to-day to every person you know, living and working in a company. So that number actually is trickling down to making an effect in every person's life as well. And that is a report from 2022. And in 2023, since we are so clear in terms of transparency on the data, we are data driven, right? And because we are data driven today, we can see and point out a little more clearly and then voice it out and make change. So I think being data driven helps us being more action oriented. And that is why, you know, initiatives like these and more that we can do here in 2023. And that's why we're talking today with more tangible actions. So for uh, our, uh, I would I would take off on where uh, Shilpa stopped with uh, saying that why not in 2023? It took us a good maybe about 200, 300 years plus to get our independence in place in India. And that's just one country, one nation and one continent. And when you're talking about a whole um, paradigm shift that's going to affect at least 50% of the population across the world, I think we have a lot to talk about. Now, if you're talking about equality as an end point in 2023, 
that's probably going to be a very um, superficial approach because we've got to start with the children. We've got to start with the kids of today. If you're going to think about that, then we have another 30 to 40 year plan ahead before real equality kicks in. So it's not going to happen. We've been talking about equality for maybe what now last 30 years. But that's that's how that's the who of us that's already in and are talking about and discussing on this platform. It needs another 30, 35 years, maybe even a century, because there are many nations, many areas of people don't even have the voice to educate their children about the future. So unless the kids are caught in time, then the gender equality, suddenly jumping to gender equality just when we get into work won't make a very big difference. It has to start at kindergarten level. It has to start where you're choosing pink and blue toys, cars versus uh, versus dolls, it has to start there. It has to start where your financial literacy is being taught, where you say, go out, go out and get this thing to the boy. And then you say, ah, oh, maybe when this sister is going, just go along with him, uh, son. It has to start there. So I guess we are we are in this for quite some time. 2023 may be one of the early phases is what my thoughts are. Thank you. Ms. Shilpa, it's wonderful to hear a woman technology you know, leader talking all technological terms. It's so refreshing to hear that. And Dr. Renita, I totally agree with you. I think gender equality starts at home, especially for new age kids to see their fathers being very involved in their care. I think that's where it all starts. So moving on to our next question. Women empowerment, equality and equity. What's the difference? Yeah, it's so much easier to talk about equality in terms of uh, uh, in terms of maybe a, a number or a ratio. But then when it comes to equity, I guess a lot starts at where you're talking about um, a secure future, having something that you specifically rely upon as you grow older. So we talk a lot about equality, but equity is something I think it's a great um, a great idea to start thinking, moving away from equality to equity, because we can we can discuss uh, giving opportunities. Uh, equality, when you talk about it, people usually say, okay, I, I allowed somebody to do something. But when it comes to equity, it's like you take your share of what you require for the future. So I see more and more women getting into financial literacy, as I, I was just discussing, and talking about um, talking about how secure you are or how secure you can get or providing channels women to get more comfortable in finance and in terms of what equity you build up over a period of time. Be it, be it anything in terms of a, a physical asset or a notional asset or, or an e-asset, any of that. And giving that, I think, to financial uh, equity is what brings in equality. Equality is a lot dependent on women's access to equity. That's true. And uh, also it shows the state of evolution of the society based on what stage they are at for each of these you know, terms. So empowerment is the action of being empowered as a community to grow, make sure, you know, everybody is getting opportunities actively. Equality is in places where, you know, I think really everything is on the same ground. Equity is to make sure that, you know, it is coming on a leveling field as well. So it depends on which, you know, uh, industry use case situation as well. And I think which community, uh, you know, is, is, you know, taking action. So we all are in different stages. And I think it is for all of us to exercise that very consciously whether you know you are taking an action towards equality what equity and creating programs that actually empower the community not just women but everybody to become empowered to help one another as well so i think that that would be uh, the difference in terms of action i say we start with equality but i guess equity is where we really want to be Dr. Dania, your, your mic. Yeah. Dr. Dania, your mic is muted. Is mute. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for those answers. And I think, um, the you know 
output of that discussion was that we have to be empowered to facilitate equality and we will be moving to equity so that's where we want to be yeah so moving on to our next question for the day what are some of your personal experiences that motivate you to think about women's empowerment so the the organization of the uh, my team at this point is predominantly and largely women and uh, uh, what i have learned from or what i have observed is that um, there is a certain looking out for each other there is a certain community growth and what starts out as a women empowerment or women employment rather eventually trickles down to be uh, a little bit more about um, uh, society as such i see that there's a trickle down effect whenever women are employed and uh, that's something i've seen i've, uh, I've earlier worked with uh, doctors without borders in africa i've also had a chance to observe the women working communities in vietnam and stuff and i guess there's this total inclusion when we when we it's predominantly uh, with, with all due respect to all the men out there because i've had phenomenal support at every stage of my working life from all the men around me so with all due respect to them uh, i feel that when there is uh, uh, when when it's predominantly men that work in an environment you need to specifically talk about inclusivity but in women inclusivity is a default setting when it's you you, you start seeing that there is a lot more inclusion all around and i think that's basically something that's tied down to how nurturing women um naturally are and uh, i i find that to be a very um important thing to learn uh, and be conscious about uh, how rewarding it is to work with an all nurturing environment mishipo i think when uh, personal is written here personal experiences so i'll share that I come from a family of fierce women who fought every generation very strongly. So in fact my company name Myra Technology is actually uh, based on my great grandmother whose name is Myra. And I remember her strength every day when I fight my entrepreneurial challenges making sure we're breaking barriers in every industry. So that's very close and personal to me. Secondly, I remember my mother's selflessness the way she's you know been selfless uh, as a family person making sure that she's hosted people she's made sure that she's handled her own health issues but i think for 11 years and she's still been selfless till the last day and uh, based on that i created usha renal care foundation so to rem- remember and to give that tribute to a uh, strong woman making that action towards society and i hope to make many more people meet many more people in the journey and amplify that uh, towards empowerment thank you definitely i i resonate with your thoughts when you say that you know from personal experience it uh, you know we will look at empowerment because i think at all our homes our mothers are the greatest you know role models for women empowerment and i think you know our mothers are more than enough to motivate us in that direction as well so moving on to our next question how do you balance your home responsibilities and running a business i think this is something all of us want to know i guess i like i said in my earlier answer i have a lot of support from the men around me i've been blessed to have people that um uh support to the point that they think that i can move mountains and play like, hello please so the, the people around me have extraordinary faith uh, in what i do and what i stand for so uh probably uh looking at my case i guess you have to get buy in from everybody that can give you a lending hand uh, regardless of how you you either you beg borrow whatever you you get support however however it works and uh, luckily for me i haven't had i haven't had much um, hurdles in 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 uh, getting in that support 
from home. Uh, I, I guess both my the family that I married into and my own family, I think it's been an extended network of support. And I, uh, my little one also supports me in whatever I do. So like if I'm studying or something, she, she comes in and says, okay, you have exams, I have exams too. So we are all in this together kind of a feeling. So at home, uh, so far, I, I don't have any specific lessons. I just got um, very, um, I wouldn't say lucky, I guess. Um, I just uh, have a very well balanced home front taking care of me, which is a very mutual thing. So if, if, if at all, if you feel that you are left out of support, sometimes I feel that it's because we feel we are allowed to work. We have to ask for help. Or if we feel we are, um, sometimes we thank for the most smallest of things, which happens by default in many equal communities and societies. But uh, I guess it's okay to ask and factor in all the support that you can garner from every corner of your support system. I think one more I agree with that. that. Men sometimes just need a little push. If you ask them, they would. <laughs> yes. So yes, Miss Sil uh, Shilpa, over to you. Yeah, I think what I liked about what, what Dr. Renata said is, you know, be vocal, vocal about it. It's okay. Like, you know, if, if we're not going to be able to do it or, you know, are not available, I think being vocal helps, you know, tell everyone, okay, I know I have things and I think people automatically, the community, not just the family, everything falls into place if you focus and prioritize. But that sounds idealistic when we say it, but I think the first step is to create good, healthy boundaries with your work life, with personal life, creating clear boundaries so that the communication is clear to the people that you're working with as well as the people people at home as well. Certain boundaries that just help you give your own sanity and your own space, which is I think very important. And once we have that, I think the responsibilities are pretty much shared uh, when we do that. Uh, secondly, I feel uh, regarding balance, uh, is to make sure that uh, you're actively communicating. That's it. Like, I think make it like a game, you know, uh, at home. I mean, make it like a fun game when there are boring works inside the house as well. Or make it a game even with your team when you're working as well. So if you know to gamify your things around and you're a fun person to make that happen. And life is not that, uh, you know, laugh it out. And I think that's, a, that's the secret behind a healthy, happy life at home and work both. So. So the key takeaway is to bring gamification to our lives as well. Yes. Yeah. So moving on to another question we have, what are the benefits of being empowered uh, and having women who are empowered in our organizations? Benefits are immense. They, 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 <laughs> being empowered runs everything for you and everything around you. So, um, to be honest, the, the idea of being empowered sometimes feels that it's you're here and then something empowers you. Sometimes it's about your own inner barriers where you feel that I have been conditioned in a particular way and therefore I will function in a particular way. It can be how you, how you see yourself. So the empowerment, sometimes it's a lot about what barriers you have set for yourself. So as much as you see empowerment as an external factor, um, See, once you've been exposed to a particular thing, say, for example, your education exposes you, your environment exposes you, your travel exposes you, or your experience exposes you, then it's up to you to take stuff from that and get empowered. Sometimes I feel that, but I've always done it this way. That can be a very, um, uh, that can be an example of an intrinsic barrier to empowerment. Sometimes you physically cannot do certain things. That's, a, that's where you feel you have to be externally empowered. So if your majority part is external empowerment, then that's a, that's a very important part for the society and the rest of us so-called empowered individuals to come in and help you fix that. But if it is a lot of intrinsic barriers that you have to your own empowerment, then I, get, then I guess that has to be a lot about stepping back and um, maybe looking over where you have set barriers for yourself and then come out of it. Because sometimes I feel we have the opportunities but sometimes we don't see what those opportunities mean to us if we were truly empowered to go all out and give it our 100% in our empowered self. Thank you, Dr. Renita. Yeah, I think uh, regarding the benefits, one key thing like organization make products, products, solutions, services for the people, 
Now, when you have empowered women in the team, you know, products are absolutely more evolved and not just empowered women, but if there's a good gender balance in the company, it helps the organization grow from all directions in terms of, you know, how you think for every consumer. So I think that I personally saw when I had, you know, uh, more women coming in as well, and especially from uh, <coughs> a company that is more experienced, is that they could really foresee the challenges of the end consumer better and that shapes the entire team's maturity as well. So I think for better products, better evolved consumer experience, organizations definitely have to make sure they get all the amazing women on board as well. Definitely and attention to detail. I think men yes. cannot look at details as good as women do. And just, just to ask and get an insight about you know, how your organizations are right uh what 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 are the ratio what is the ratio of men and women in your organizations both dr Renita and mishilpa and just just to get an insight about how how you run your organization and how many women you actually have working for you so we maintain a perfect ratio but i mean it goes up and down but i think we try to maintain consciously um, we have programs that help, uh, you know, an active funnel to maintain the balance. So I'm pretty conscious about that, I, you know, personally. So we maintain the balance. Like uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, there are two firms basically. At the first one where we, it's mostly a service oriented um, set up the clinic. We are, I think, 90%, no, at least 85% women. Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> At the at the e-commerce, I think it's around uh, 50, 50 percent, and you see mm -hmm. the women in mostly the production QC side, and you see the men in the handling side. So, so I guess even there, there is a basic bias in the e-commerce side, and but in the service side, it's almost ninety percent women. I mean, all of all of my consultants are women. So yes. <laughs> That's so nice to hear. And personally, from Secura Health and Star Health, I know of uh, you know women occupying most of the top seats. So that probably speaks a lot for the success of an organization as well. So moving on to our next question: Health is wealth, and the recent pandemic made everyone realize how crucial it is and acted as a wake-up call. How do you think you can contribute to taking care of the health of your family as well as people working in your organization? Um, in terms of the family, I said, I guess I, I am probably the one that's being taken care of. So <laughs> at best, at best, I get to give my gyan as the doctor in the family. That's about it. But mostly it's uh, family support that runs me in terms of my health. I get taken care of pretty well. Uh, when it comes to the organizations, very recently we introduced a very small step to make us all feel a little powered up through the day. We introduced fruits in the morning break. And I guess that, that made a big difference to everybody around because yes, we were used to a little bit of snacking here there, but the small, uh, I think it comes around at 11 o'clock and my team gets to vote as who wants what because if they let it to, let it to me to vote, I'll be choosing grapes and oranges every day, but then there's a more balanced team out there that decides what they want to. So very small steps that make them conscious. And because we are in healthcare and because we counsel our clients and patients, there is a fair bit of understanding of the ratio of uh, what needs to go in your macros, micros and all of that. Somehow it trickles down into staff health as well. Now, we also have sports, annual sports events and stuff. We also have a lot of um, activities. And uh, I think at some point we also had regular Zumba classes and stuff till COVID did a little fair bit of disruption. We still do have these games and sports events going on. So uh, maybe because you're closely allied to health, the idea of taking care of yourself, and we are in aesthetics uh, where it's a lot about putting yourself first in self-care, look, take, giving the time to yourself to be comfortable about yourself. So uh, I guess that trickles down because it's a culture of what we do. So, yeah. Just to know I'm in the tech industry from Vishilpa. Yes. Yeah, I could very well relate when you said like, you know, those Zimba activities. So we also had, we used to play football in the morning, going to a park uh, Monday mornings because, you know, we didn't want that Monday blue kind of an environment. So 
could very well relate prior to the pandemic and uh, now we are still finding different ways to make sure that you know we keep a very healthy hearty uh, environment culture in the company uh, one thing that we penalize everyone on is working late hours we don't uh, appreciate that so 5 hours of work can happen in 5 hours not 10 hours and i think that's a culture that we've strongly created i want everyone to clock off what what whatever the time official time is and uh, that's created as a good you know a uh, sanctity check on you know having a good work life balance because otherwise it's endless as well so i think creating you know defined boundaries for people inside uh, the work the workspace as well as with your customers as well to make sure that you know it's a healthy time it's a very clear predictive uh, way of operations as well that's one and then secondly Yeah, I think uh, making sure there's laughter in the office, and uh, I think such activities as you rightly mentioned, and we miss that now. But yeah, that reminds me to again take it up again. So I think hitting the park and doing your daily stand-ups in the morning just changes the vibe altogether. And uh, I think that's that's been helpful. And having a lively, alive team, and and it's it's actually based on the leadership sometimes, and it's a very uh, you know culture thing. So making sure that we're being health conscious. and then also we also consciously encourage people to think for the future because we are a futuristic company and i think being your you know keeping yourself covered with insurances making sure you plan for the future giving a good uh, you know secure future is i think something that we also educate to everyone in our organization as well yeah the insurance thing makes a big difference in terms of it could be anything it could be you know it it could be taking up a regular plan for your future it could be something that you set time aside to plan your meals it could be that you invest time in a regular exercise program it could be anything but all of these things mean long term benefits they don't look like much but they all bring in cumulative benefits that add on that accrue over time so whatever the area that you want to work on in terms of health uh, you don't we always say you don't achieve six pack in a day and you don't even if you achieve the six pack they don't stay if you can if you stop exercising so it it continues there's a small incremental benefit to these small small actions that we take so at the end of it you're looking at compound interest and cumulative benefits and that's when you feel that's where the equity kicks in because you've taken care of you you've taken care of yourself for the future than depend on anybody else absolutely yes and a very fun way in our office where uh, you know our management maintains our health is by switching off the elevators and lifts at a certain particular time in the mornings so everyone is forced to take the stairs so yeah how many floors is that three okay <laughs> not much but sufficient <laughs> yeah, i'm on eight so, that's so yeah <laughs> sorry i'm on eight so yes Wow. Okay, we cannot try with that. Then. Yes. So moving on to our next question: What innovative solutions are being developed, or has been developed, to improve healthcare access and outcomes for women? Yeah, happy to take this one. Um, I think one is with this current time. Usually, uh, women, uh, you know, are very reluctant sometimes in the past generations to get up and even go in places because it might not be safe. uh health wise hazard wise in terms of industrial factory areas and stuff as well now with you know innovative solutions there's better monitoring of uh you know hazardous health hazardous conditions to make sure that you know women are safe as well and uh secondly one simple thing that we all can relate previously you know all our documents of medical used to be scattered and we it's for us to collect and make sure you take it to the doctor now there are better ehr integrated solutions that are just compiling that all together doctors also get a larger amount of data for you know women from the past history of uh, things as well little more clearly we have simple apps that check our cycles uh, menstrual cycles pretty you know well as well so i think these are simple things but they make a big long impact and that's what i think uh, makes a difference second i think is also nutrition we're all much more conscious now about whether you know meals are nutritionally balanced or not so i think these things definitely help uh, lastly rural areas mammograms and uh, checks for breast cancer as well it's become a lot easier to take iot devices that actually go to the rural areas to do these checks sonography checks as well you know in a mobile way 
and doctors can actually real time see it through a remote uh, uh, connection as well so that these kind of solutions absolutely help uh, you know diagnosing diagnosing faster and then we are ahead of the curve because of that so i think that's happening actively and there's a lot of ground to cover but it's uh, at least there's you know technology solutions now that's you know out there uh, doing this more and more and we're becoming more predictive preventative than being reactive for that matter i'd i'd continue with where we where you spoke about how it's becoming a, a lot more easy to collate and maintain data so one of the things that we um, found very useful was to look at longitudinal behaviors of uh, you know so, something as simple as insulin resistance impacting everything in our field in terms of acne or hair loss and there comes a predictive data that says that probably you need to work a little bit more in in this domain of hair loss because insulin resistance seems to be uh, seems to be going a little haywire something as simple as polycystic ovaries pco which uh, which does factor in which does feature a number of Uh, you 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 see so many more women young women coming in with pcos with insulin resistance and you see that there are these long term lifestyle um interventions which again dependent on uh, be dependent on iot be dependent on self monitored apps so you you i would call this the creative disruption of medicine where you basically take all of that it was to the doctor to follow up certain things it was to the doctor to give you certain bits of advice but now you have the data you have you can look at it over a period of time and you can derive action points that may be very very specific and unique to you so it's like you you've got information from the community but it's also personalized um advice for you based on this personalized health plan yeah i think yes. that's that's the beauty of uh, technology coming in and it's coming fast so i think uh, it's going to have a lot more improved lives ahead so excited for that definitely and i think telemedicine has to be in a game changer especially after the pandemic so we are we are in the right direction so moving on to our next question has technology and innovation helped level the playing field for women entrepreneurs and professionals absolutely yes because um, i think now core industrial engineering spaces uh, where you know previously it was just men uh, you know out there just dominant because it was muscular biology uh, requirements of that industry were different but now with technology and innovation so i'll give you an example of a guy who uh, needs to climb up some space in the factory to go and check whether it's fine or not it's that manual now i think we can have a man or a woman actually you know controlling a drone and it can go up and do the job you don't need muscle for that same industrial work uh, similar to you know even tires you know it was it, uh, changing tires used to be very difficult and you know that is what uh, prevented a lot of women female drivers in the earliest time now there are pneumatic uh, you know ways to pull it out as well So technology innovation is absolutely helping uh, not just women entrepreneurs or professionals but every industry and sector and it's also making it safer because right now unfortunately there's 1.2% of the global seafarers so people who go on the ships uh, you know are only it's just 1.2% are women and that means the maritime where the food that we eat import export things that come to us and the people who are doing it are majorly predominantly men and that is why the you know the gender balance is totally disbalanced over the years but now because this technology the cameras that can actually keep a check on somebody going you know doing anything wrong and i think we can keep a very good scrutiny on things to make things fair so i'm excited for this generation and era and a lot more to come in the space uh those are brilliant insights over there uh i'd say technology is a big equalizer uh 15 20 years down the line i think the whole disparity thing might be uh, a lot lot less skewed primarily because of technology because as she said uh, as she said there's a there's a lot it's it's leveled out a lot of difficulties it's leveled out a lot of une- unevenness and bumpiness because right now even if you want to send people elsewhere to do stuff with a lot of more first you don't have to physically go there like you like and and then covid made us made us realize that we could do a lot of things without really getting there and being in person physically and and the other part is that um 
where there's a, a lot less involved, uh, a lot less physicality involved. It, it uh, then you get your mental prowess to the forefront, and then it's more or less a level playing ground. That's true, and I love that everybody's learned remote working, so it's created a good level ground. Men and women all all enjoy, and I think everybody can do that. So I think that's that's created increase of access. Yeah, I, I think I love that part. That's a good learning out of a very tough pandemic. But yeah, that's a good uh, thing that came out. We kind of said that. Uh, Technology, new technology equalizes what testosterone doesn't. Absolutely, yes. And I think a hybrid working atmosphere with both, you know, remote working as well as at office working actually boosts mental health as well. So I totally agree with whatever you had to say. So I think we have come to the end of our discussion. So we will move on to our final session. Yeah, so uh, before we move on to the audience q and I would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to both our lovely panelists for the insightful session and taking the time to answer all our questions. Uh, so we would now have an audience q and session where the audience can ask any any question to both our panelists and they would be more than happy to answer your questions. I would encourage you to take this time to you know shout out and ask your questions. Uh, what you can do is either you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you or you can post your question in the chat box and we will take that up. So, do we have any questions? So, so there's Akash who says, thank you for such a good session. And he is asking us to wait for a second so that he can type his question. Yes, please. Okay, so there's a question here from uh, Nikin Ham Hamilton who answered most of our quiz questions. So, <laughs> so we have a question from him and he says, historically men have had better access to technology than women. There's a big digital divide between sexes. Maybe now with tech and innovation in almost all fields, there might be a progress in gender divide up to a level, but won't the digital divide increase over time? Like, isn't it a vicious circle? I guess the answer, the, the, the question partly holds the answer as well. So compared to every other kind of divide, um, I guess the digital divide is probably a little easier to navigate because it lacks the inherent physicality of um, what has been dividing men and women in terms of access. I mean, like what we discussed in the last question, going someplace, being somewhere. Rather, most of us have access to tech right here in our hands, in our phones. Uh, so I guess the digital divide, or rather the digital undivide, maybe what we see uh, as compared to more disparity in the future. And to add to that, I think evolution is a continuous process. So problems will keep coming and we'll, keep, we'll all have to keep solving. What remains a constant is I think our focus or our motivation to be a part of the change. So I think problems, polar, polarizations and stuff will come and it's about being aware and being, having the courage to go and I think change that together. And we all will do that together. So cheers to that. Yes. So we will be playing an instrumental part in breaking that vicious cycle. So moving on to our next question from Vandana, we have Vandana who asks, how can we maintain a good work-life balance? Being strict with boundaries and not just us, 
but even our better halves as well. So sometimes, uh, and I, I, I was really thinking before this talk as well of how to put it in a nice way, but uh, you know, availability, being available wrongly or too much, like men are sometimes having that luxury that, okay, last minute meeting at 10 p.m. at night, okay, I'll come on board. But you are actually adding to the gender divide at that time because somebody at home is probably taking care and having, you know, putting out and being there as well. So I think creating those strict professional boundaries that help everyone to get that access and being that clear and corporate about things. I think that helps everyone. And if you're communicating that beforehand to your customers, to your partners, team members, let's do that. And if it's a meeting, Reschedule for 10 p.m. That's fine. Then you're communicating to your family as well that you wouldn't be available. But let's not do those last minutes of time. I think that's not a healthy habit. So creating professional, clear boundaries and being strong and brave about it. You might face frictions about it. And I think the only thing that you can do is be relentless and excel in other areas at times. And then, you know, make sure you command that uh, out of your team as well. So earn it up right away. Um, I have a slightly different opinion in terms of how but how you switch off from work. I, I, I probably may be uh, having a, an odd opinion out there as well. But I said somewhere that if you're not thinking about something in the shower, then it's not something that you probably are, that then it's not something that you're working, what we're working on is probably worth it. Because sometimes you have these vague ideas, thoughts that happen when, you were, when you're traveling, it's supposed to be on a, on a digital detox and you think about this idea and you're looking for something to jot that down and work on it. Uh, sometimes when your idea is very big and it's always in your mind to think about it and entrepreneurs at times, we need that kind of a continuous focus on what we're doing. So I always have this, uh, um, you know, a little different approach to boundaries when I say it's Maybe you don't need to look at it as a daily boundary. Maybe you might want to think about as, of it as like you work in time blocks, blocks of time working on something, and then you move away from it. Not just in terms of creating and uh, creating the ability to take care of somebody or something, but also in terms of being able to stand back and see what it looks like to you from a distance. Because uh, at times you are so engrossed in something, especially when it's deep, deep work, and you can't switch off. And then you, your family is looking at, okay, is she going to get ready or what? So, and then you, you, you are also communicated with like, say, I, I really have something going on, but I'm going to be able to, like you said, beautifully, I'm going to be able to take this time off. Sometimes I'm able to, sometimes I'm not. And that's when I'm like, okay, I'll make up for it some other time, but the intention is there. But um, so in, in an entrepreneur's journey, you, you sometimes your deadlines come up like that, and then you've got to be flexible. So maybe it's about an individual's working style as to where you work, best what kind of how you work better and then communicating it to people around you so that it's win-win for everybody around charged as guilty right <laughs> in terms of uh, i think something you're very passionate about sometimes you don't and, and that's the reality of it that you know you depth and that's a boundary that you create fr from your family time then that you're yeah. just creating that i need this space as well so i think communicating will absolutely help and being vocal and then more and more communication leads to a better balance and having a better team everywhere at work as well as family both our teams in the various forms exactly. one can understand more maybe or less but communicating helps so i think that'll help to create a balance yeah so identifying what works for us and communicating this to people around us i think makes a world of difference that brings us to our next question from akash uh, so he puts it right here. So he says, we are talking a lot about equality and expecting the women to give their best at work. But then once they are home, we are also expecting them to handle the entire housework. Men don't seem to think of equality there. How do we, how do you think we can encourage men to take this whole equality thing equally, even at home? Start with the boys, start with the boys. It's not going to happen overnight because we've seen our grandparents being, our granddads being served by grandmoms, moms being, dads being served by moms. We've seen this everywhere. We've, we've seen this literally across multiple centuries. So if we want to start with the change, it has to start with the kids. It has to start, um, they, had, they had to see, they have to see not just the boys seeing dads being responsible, but also the girls 
seeing dads being responsible so they know what to get from their partner or what to get from the support around them and sometimes it's maybe as simple as don't yell at girls or or you know how children girls especially take yelling much more easily than than boys do that's because we've always conditioned that like yeah tell the boys but scold the girls or like put her in place small small things like that which will which will um make make a very uh, small tangible but doable doable change over a period of time like a very visible change even if it starts at very small steps how how often do you raise your voice back to your mom as you do to your dad big difference so all of that has to start with the children we need to teach the children the kids be it don't be it bullying at school or however it has to start from there so i think that's the foundation and now i think people are as you rightly said are seeing that like both parents are actively doing uh, you know proper roles inside the house as well and i think uh, akash when you mentioned like you know what can we do to you know encourage the men of the current generation who are also having working uh, partners along is i think uh, just be like independent learn to be independent first whether you're married or not i think learn to do everything for yourself so if if you you know stayed out on your own uh, you know independently then you would know about every single thing that happens in the house so i think that's a simple thing that be responsible for your own work and if you're able to do everything from uh, every work inside the house outside the house for the responsibilities of the house as an individual then you can do that as a team as well and uh, not just equality it's about equity as well so there are times that are biologically different for women as well and uh, probably the man has to do a lot more so i think that is a hands on learning and uh, i think one thing for the uh, women as well if if the man doesn't know to do it just leave him to do it learn it on on his own as well so people are hungry they cook so i think it's it's okay to people uh, everyone to learn on the journey and it is a hard time for everyone to learn something that's new they've not seen it in their parents generation so having that empathy is also okay and um, i think sometimes there are burnt dinners but it's okay i think let's let's have fun with that as well and uh, it's a learning it's surprisingly job. men are sometimes better cooks than women It's, it's it's both ways it mirrors both ways you teach the men you teach the boys to cook you teach the girls to pick stuff too so it's okay. it's both ways it's like you like uh uh she so beautifully said it's about being uh, enough for yourself being independent for, on yourself you you teach the boys to travel teach the girls also to travel teach them both to cook teach them both to definitely clean up after themselves so these are things that you that you do without a gender mm-hmm. um uh and it should be gender agnostic the stuff that we need to live on it our activities of daily life should have a lot of gender agnosticism exactly and then it becomes muscle muscle memory then you don't really think about yes. it you know like i think it's then that simple but yeah till it becomes a muscle mm-hmm. memory let the person cover do that again and again and again and then it will be fine yeah i think yeah totally agree with that yeah so we'll move on to our next question which is from uh Neetu who asks what would you like to emphasize for women in leadership I'd say it's a uh, uh, I'd say you start with a very nice um, well thought out personal journey as to what your values are as to what your um, abilities what abilities you want to work over a period of time and um, my my belief has been that uh the biggest impedance to doing something comes from within of from our conditioning and stuff so i'd say the first thing is to start increasing the exposure and then you before you decide what you want to do or before you decide how you want to do it it may be good to have a lot more exposure to what all you feel you can shine in or what all you feel will fulfill you so uh probably more skills more exposure and a lot deeper knowledge of who you are who you are and what you want to stand for yes i think i totally agree with dr renita that you know your skill can take you long places so i think going deep into your craft actually can uh, you know make you as the one who is sought after so i think becoming specializing in that and then 
being vocal about it again and again to many people propagating it and lastly i think networking a lot of people i mean especially uh, like i i've seen there are like alcohol based parties or bro drinks that happen start criticizing them up front let them be ashamed of not including or being inclusive in the parties as well if it comes to networking and we do lose out in networking many a times because we don't have time to bro and chill and then uh, waste our time on you know abusive stuff to our biological bodies because we are you know carers and nurturers internally biologically as well so be vocal about it and speak it out point it out that this is not something that you appreciate and then people will then think that they're doing something and then they can be a little more inclusive as well so women leaders don't be afraid to i think be vocal and speak it out and have a skill that i think outshines you and you know people will come to you uh, when you have deep knowledge deep skills as well yeah, yeah and then don't criticize yourself a lot don't judge yourself a lot i guess that that part of it has to be left behind at some point uh, where you're like constantly constantly evaluating yourself because i guess women are are we have some amount of perfectionism as default setting so i guess it's okay so we'll get to do stuff better the time yes guilty on that till today i think over criticizing uh, internally in your own brain while you're even speaking is i think an activity that happens internally so and shut down the imposter in you the imposter syndrome is so ingrained yeah <laughs> yeah true, true. so i think the key takeaway is to equip ourselves with better knowledge and better skills first and then deal with the other things yeah so uh we'll move on i think we're running short of time we'll just take uh, the last couple of questions uh, before we wrap up the session so uh, we have a question from amita who says how do you deal with people saying men are more logical or intelligent than women we know it's not true but hearing this often leads us to doubt ourselves on a regular basis would love to hear your thoughts on these i think your proof of work needs to speak for yourself so keep showing your proof of work actively and be so relentless to be so uh, aggressive about it like not just in one direction but create 10 more channels of your proof of work so you if one person doesn't listen to you it doesn't matter that's probably not your right audience but create 10 more channels uh, with your proof of work so the internet is a great platform anyway to put your proof of work out there but then become you know like okay you can't see my work clearly or logical or whatever yet yeah, there are there are 10 more people so increase the number of channels uh, where your proof of work can be really seen i i think you also would want to do not socialize with that person who says men are more logical mm-hmm. and intelligent just cut out negative people out of your life because you, you like you said like uh, shipa said your work speaks for yourself and that's about it you really don't have to justify uh, you 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 don't need to um explain everything that you've worked on or the uh, who you are you have a surrogate that's your work to explain it for you and that's it you really don't have to even hang out or uh, convince them that you have logic uh, th- that's not the game at all the game is you your work and that's it it's not it's not a it's not popularity contest at all you just keep doing what you're supposed to do in terms of what you what standards you set for yourself and the rest should fall in place i feel like cutting out negative people not engaging with them gives so much peace to the self to focus on stuff that matters totally agree i think one thing women uh, have a very tough time doing is to cut off you know the wrong people from their lives but i think the world will be a much better place if people start doing that so uh, we'll just take the last uh, two questions before we wrap up uh, we have pirose who asks how can women be empowered to handle their own finances and not depend on their father or brother or husband I think I saw an ad. I do not know which which uh, financial company put that out. It's about the gender gap that happens as we speak about financial. So uh, initially, everybody is equal, and then they move steps back depending on what they are financially empowered to do. Um, again, I, I think I've said that multiple times. I think um, it starts at the level of the school going child. Uh, it starts at somebody who is made to feel. Uh, is made to understand the economics of what happens at home what happens in the country so just as much as um, we teach our boys to handle those things it's about starting to do the micro economics at home even if it can be something as basic as uh, i think uh, all parents should get should buy into the concept of responsible 
pocket money in terms of what you do, what you earn, what taxation is at the very early stage. Because one fine day, you're, you're doing your masters, you're doing your studying, you're doing science. And then one fine day, there's this tax. And you're like, I don't know, let me get somebody. I, I think that should stop. That should not. I think taxation should be part of the school curriculum as early as class five, class six. Agreed. These are basic things that have to be taught. And one of the fastest way to learn is to put yourself in communities around you who speak this language day in and day out. So I'm a part of like Goldman Sachs 10,000 women. And I have like entrepreneur friends, female friends that are from different age groups, different experiences. And uh, even my mentor from Goldman Sachs, she works in the asset management, uh, the management space. So we talk that financial language. And that becomes so familiar to you that you become more hands-on as well. So surround yourself with the people who are actually doing, uh, you know, actions towards financial uh, management as well. And, you know, understand that through networking, through communities around you. That's the best way to be a little more hands-on. Yeah, the Goldman Sachs uh, work, workshop was the first place where like, wow, there's, there's this financial, the same 10,000 women entrepreneurship program. It's like, okay, there's so much to, there's so much in the back end that we've not even been focusing on. So I guess that curriculum needs to come in in every every child's, uh, maybe by, by mid, middle school, high school, I think they should definitely start knowing this at least. Absolutely. I agree with both of you there. I think... Uh, the minute uh, women start talking about mutual funds and SIP and FDs and whatnot, I think that's where, you know, gender equality should take us. And uh, moving to our final question from the audience, I'm going to uh, club two questions, one from Gomati and the other from Gokul. So this is a club question. So is India progressing in the right direction in terms of gender equality? And how do you think you can bridge the gap in rural areas where they do not have access to technology? I guess there's a long yes. way to go. Uh, you can take it that way. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Anita, and then I'll put the other view. Yeah. yeah. I guess we have a long way to go because even in, in rural areas, even in terms of access to healthcare, the health seeking behavior of people for even basic conditions like diabetes and hypertension, and the number of conditions that stay, cancer remains undiagnosed in rural women for much, much longer as compared to men. So there are big divides in terms of even healthcare access, health seeking behavior. So, um, but I guess that's where tech is really going to make a huge difference in terms of making it non-threatening to women to come out and ask for help. I think that's where tech is going to be a game changer. And in that way, I guess we are, we are, we are progressing pretty fast and well and, and in due time. Yeah, and but where do you see India in the next, let's say, 10 years? Sorry? Sorry? Uh, where do you see India in the next 10 years? I mean, this is from myself. So where do you see India in the next 10 years in terms of gender equality and how we use the innovation? I think we see, we will see more and more women entrepreneurs in every sector. And we are seeing that, I would say, and not just from the urban cities, but also from, uh, you know, different parts of the country. And it's, it's becoming more, uh, you know, accessible from all parts because of the internet, the digital transformations in all the states. But yeah, the beauty of like this kind of a conversation is you get to hear both sides of the coin and you understand, you know, there is a lack even now, absolutely. But I think because more and more industrial uh, industries are opening to women, then we'll see more female leaders, uh, I think, across all industries. And that will create a mature society in the coming years. And I think India is doing very well. Uh, globally, I think we will be amazing. Uh, it is a country to watch for. Thank you. So we are definitely in the right direction and see the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, thank you to Dr. Shilp, uh, Dr. Verita and Ms. Shilpa. So it's now time to wrap up our Women's Day webinar. I would like to acknowledge and applaud Star Health for prioritizing their customers and the public by organizing a myriad of free webinars and programs aimed at improving their overall health and well-being. This webinar is just one example of the many initiatives it has taken in the recent past. I would also like to thank our panelists once again, Dr. Renita and Ms. Shilpa, you both were a delight to our minds, and I'm sure you have kindled the spark within every single attendee who has joined today to go out there and represent gender equality. 
Finally, I would like to thank Secura Health, a company I fondly call my second home, for this unwavering passion in the digital health space. Our collaboration with Star Health has indeed been a game changer, and our association will enable the betterment of millions of lives digitally. To enca encapsulate everything spoken and discussed today, digital tools are a boon to equality and can be used by each one of us to make this world a safer place for women where she is not discriminated and is given equal opportunities as her male counterparts. Remember that gender equality must become a lived reality. The social movement starts today. It starts now. It starts with you and me. Thank you.